Our, our next speaker is the distinguished Robert Clinton Foundation Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University and an affiliated faculty member of the ASU American Indian Studies Program. He is also a faculty fellow at the Center for Law, Science, and Innovation. Clinton has served on the courts of several tribes in addition to teaching and writing about tribal law, American Indian, American Indian history, federal courts, cyberspace law, copyright, and civil procedure. His publications include numerous articles on federal Indian law and policy, constitutional law, and federal jurisdiction. Professor, Professor Clinton, welcome. While we're getting the uh, PowerPoint set up, I want to uh, thank uh, Kevin Gover and Susan Harjo uh, for involving me in this project and the wonderful staff of NMAI, including Sally and Elizabeth, for all of the hospitality and all of the help uh, on both the uh, uh, essay in the book and on the project. Uh, it's a little difficult to follow Senator Tesler and uh, Assistant Secretary Washburn um, uh, uh, this morning, but nevertheless, I'll try. And what I'm going to try to do with you for the brief time I have uh, available is to do a 400 year plus historical survey uh, about uh, uh, Indians and uh, Indian treaties um, and to try to put them in some perspective, some of which uh, Assistant Secretary Washburn has already adverted to. Um, basically, uh, treaties are an interesting phenomena, particularly of North America. It's sort of tempting to think that uh, uh, somehow Europeans brought treaties to North America, but in fact, that's not true. Uh, we know, if you think about it, um, that at the time of first contact, um, there was a rich set of tribal alliances, tribal negotiations, intertribal relations between the original native occupants of North America. In fact, if you think about it, the uh, great law of peace of the Haudenosaunee, I won't try to pronounce it in Iroquois since I'm not an Iroquoian speaker and do not want to murder it, um, was in fact just an elaborated treaty among five nations that formed the basis of that confederation. So when the British and the Dutch and to a lesser extent the French showed up on the American continent, um, essentially treaty relationships had already been established and they just fell into pace with the idea of negotiating sovereign to sovereign with Indian tribes. Um, we're tempted to think of treaties as a memorialized document, but what I'm going to try to show you today is that that's not the way initially the treaty relationship was understood either by Europeans or by the native community, but it evolved into that on the western side, on the colonial side, creating all kinds of problems and uh, misunderstandings. Now, if one were to look uh, at uh, the treaties themselves, both during the colonial period and the treaties with the United States, you find a very common pattern. There's an initial first contact treaty. I like to call it a peace and friendship treaty. Generally, the Western power, the Western colonial power is seeking relations with the tribe, seeking friendly relations, and given the competition at the time during the colonial period between the French, the Dutch, the English, trying to create exclusivity of a relationship with a particular colonial power. This usually was not a treaty asking for a land session. The next one was. And then the one after that asked for more land and more land and ultimately removal and relocation. So as Assistant Secretary Washburn adverted to, treaties wound up being essentially a colonial vehicle for dispossession of native land during the colonial period and during the American treaty period. They essentially, 
were vehicles for enforcing the doctrine of discovery. Now, those of you familiar with the doctrine of discovery know it derives ultimately from the British claims to colonial authority in North America. It's a particularly British doctrine, actually, um, that it basically was designed to rationalize colonial dispossession of the native occupants of the soil of North America. And basically, it created a relationship which provided a basis for dispossession, one basis of which was, quote, consent, unquote. What are the treaties? They're the consent in the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery is reviled by indigenous people. And yet treaties aren't. It's a very interesting contradiction. It's a contradiction that Assistant Secretary Washburn adverted to. It's one uh, we need to explore. Frequently in Indian country, as Assistant Secretary Washburn adverted to, treaties are revered icons. Despite being the vehicles for dispossession under the doctrine of discovery, many tribes claim the font of their power, their Indian rights, is in their treaties. Now, I happen to teach in Arizona. There's only one tribe out of the 22 tribes in Arizona that has a treaty with the United States, the Navajo Nation. All of the other tribes have no treaties. Yet, as Assistant Secretary Washburn, in fact, adverted to, you will frequently hear tribal members in the non-treaty tribes adverting to their treaty rights, talking about the enforcement of their rights under a treaty that they don't have. Treaties have become synonymous with the font of both Indian rights and Indian sovereign power. Well, that causes a rather interesting set of questions. You see demonstrations here, the Honor the Treaties Organization um, holding a, a meeting, uh, treating the treaty as a revered iconic emblem of that source of power. Now, of course, this all creates a bit of a contradiction. If treaties are, in fact, the historical vehicle for consent under the doctrine of discovery and, therefore, dispossession of natives, of indigenous people, of their aboriginal lands. How is it they've become iconic sources of native power and rights? And it's that history I want to focus your attention on briefly in my remaining time. At contact, neither the British, or European generally, colonial side, nor the Indian tribes thought of treaties and alliances as a memorialized document. At contact, the British side had conceptions of alliances that were top-down organic familial relationships. Monarchical dynastic marriage was common in Europe as a vehicle of creating alliance. It wasn't a piece of paper. It was a kinship tie. By contrast, the Indians, the native peoples, the native nations, viewed alliances in kinship terms. They were organized around extended families. They thought of political relationships as kinship relationships. And you see this played out in the references in the colonial treaties themselves, some of which are quoted in the book. I won't go into detail now. But the whole idea, strangely enough, not only on the Indian side, but also initially on the European side in these relationships was kinship. 
But the difference is the European conception of the relationship was monarchical down. For the most part, the native conception was much more horizontal, though there's a some level of hierarchy within kinship family relationships. But it was basically a flatter, not hierarchical relationship. So kinship terminology shows up in the treaty negotiations with the Haudenosaunee, who would meet periodically for reasons I'm about to talk about, with uh, the Albany um, New York commissioners and other representatives of the Northeast colonies, um, to basically renew the covenant chain of friendship, the alliance, the kinship relationship, which bound them together frequently against the French or some other uh, uh, interloper who might uh, uh, interfere with the uh, document. So treaties in the colonial period, at least in the 17th and early uh, 18th centuries, are about kinship. They're about forming alliances. And just as you don't have a document that knits together your family, you have family reunions. You have relationships. It's organic, it's ongoing. Similarly, the document, if there was one at all, and generally there was not, was not the object of a treaty discussion in the 17th or uh, 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 early uh, 18th century between the British colonial authorities and native peoples. The point of the discussion was the kinship alliance, the relationship. It was a family reunion, if you will. It was to work out differences in an organic relationship just as today, NATO periodically meets to work out relationships among the family of the NATO alliances, and there is not an expectation that a new document will come out of that relationship. In fact, this is evident in this print, which is gonna be very hard to read at a distance, that was published by Benjamin Franklin, I think it was published in 1747, of a, quote, treaty held at Albany between the Haudenosaunee and the Albany Indian commissioners and representatives from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. This is a treaty held at a particular point. Does the document reflect a memorialized agreement signed by two parties? Not at all. It's a meeting of the two parties. It's an organic concept. Indian treaties began as this organic relationship on both sides, not just on the Indian side. Now, the critical relationship was, at least from the native, the indigenous point of view, that the natives had agency in the relationship that is, they were actors, they were players, they brought their concerns to the table. They were consulted about the relationship. They, in fact, weren't told what the policy was. They were consulted in the policy formulation. So they were active actors in that relationship and they were consulted in the relationship, and then ultimately, for anything to change, they had to consent to it. So these are the three critical elements, particularly from an indigenous point of view, about the treaty relationship, however it's cast in familial terms. Agency, consultation, and informed and free consent. Those are the core elements of a treaty relationship. And we're going to see that they erode over time. Now, these treaties and the relationship were often formalized in not a document so much as a wampum belt or a ceremonial gift, 
Here we have Jake Edwards of the Haudenosaunee Confederation holding, and I'm not sure whether they're original or replicas, of the two-nation wampum belt commemorating a treaty, quote unquote, within the meaning I just gave it, of a 1612 agreement or treaty relationship with the Dutch and the Canandaiga uh, wampum belt on uh, the anniversary of uh, uh, these um, uh, agreements. Uh, this is a peace medal, the President Buchanan Peace Medal, that I believe is in the collection here at M NMAI, um, also given out to memorialize this relationship in the treaty relationship. Now, it turns out that the problem with treaties begins not on the native side, but like many problems, begins on the western side, begins on the Anglo-American side. The idea of what a treaty is begins to start changing in Europe with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which is generally traced to the beginning of international relations in a modern sense in Europe. Increasingly, treaties are formalized into documents in a written language, the idea of dynastic marriage alliances begins to dissolve in favor of these paper documents. And that gradually trickles over into North America. But from a native side, this idea that a treaty is a dynamic, organic kinship relationship continues. They aren't part of what's going on in Europe. So when they think they're making an agreement with the British, or later the Americans. It is an organic kinship relationship within their culture in a way that increasingly is not understood by the people with whom they're making the agreement who simply want the signature on the bottom line of a document to get the informed consent for whatever the treaty says, usually the dispossession of the native people. So we see an increased focus of Westerners on a memorialized treaty beginning in the late 18th and continuing into the 19th century. Now, of course, treaties are negotiated in multiple languages. Most of the tribes didn't speak English at the time. They spoke their native language. There may have been an intermediate interpreter, as there is in the fishing rights treaties, the Stevens treaties, the Pacific Northwest, where the Chinook jargon was used. But if you're going to focus on a memorialized document instead of a kinship relationship, you have a problem because the native languages, at least in North America, were all oral languages. They're not, at this point, written languages. So there's the possibility that the memorialized document might not reflect a common understanding, and we're still might be to the advantage of the party who's negotiating the memorialization, i.e. the British or later the Americans. It's long been said by native people that the language of these treaties doesn't reflect the understanding of these treaties as they understand them through their oral tradition. And of course, with an increased focus on language, a lot of people don't understand that, but I think you can begin to see why this might be true. Turns out there's proof of that fact in a treaty not from North America, but the major treaty in New Zealand with the Maori, the Treaty of Waitangi of 1840. Now, why does it prove it? Well, it turns out the missionaries had been with the Maori for quite a while before that treaty was negotiated. And Maori had been transliterated, and many of the Maori were literate in the language. So unlike every other treaty in North America, the Maori Treaty was written and memorialized in language in two different languages, in English and in Maori. It's a very short treaty. It's only four articles. The first one purports to cede all sovereignty to the crown. You read it in Maori, 
and it seems to give a heck of a lot less. What does it give? Well, it allows the crown basically to serve as a leader for the Maori people, but cedes no governmental authority to the crown. Well, that's a big difference. You can see that the Waitangi Treaty, where there is documentary proof in two different languages, doesn't say the same thing in English and in Maori. And therefore, the native common understanding that the memorialized written document doesn't capture the agreement is probably true in many more instances than we might guess. Now, out of this phenomena come three canons of construction, of interpretation of treaties that in fact we use commonly, but unfortunately the courts have increasingly ignored, in Indian law. But they've been very important historically. What are they? That treaties should be construed as Indians would have understood them, that treaties should be liberally construed in favor of the Indians, and that ambiguity in treaty terms should be interpreted in favor of the Indians. And of course, these canons of construction were originally designed to assure that that trust relationship that a sec this is the Secretary Washburn talked about would in fact be upheld and that the United States would act, quote, with utmost good faith, unquote, toward the Indians. The increased abandonment of any reliance on these canons of construction in the federal courts says all too much and all too loudly about what the federal courts have been doing recently and whether they are acting with utmost good faith in their upholding of the western side of what should be a bilateral treaty relationship. Now, if you understand treaty relationships internationally, you know that a treaty isn't self-executing. A treaty doesn't happen overnight, and you write it down on paper, and whatever's on the paper happens. The geopolitical balance, the forces arrayed on one side or another, the leverage, affect whether the treaty is going to be enforced, and unfortunately, that's true of the evolution of the Anglo-American treaty relationship. If one looks at the British colonial treaties, and then one looks at the early American treaties, most of them are negotiated at arm's length between Great Britain initially and its representatives or the colonies, and then later the United States representatives, with tribes who had the power by allying with other colonial powers in North America or with themselves to literally threaten the security of a colony, even of the United States, until when? Until the War of 1812. Many of you know the history of the War of 1812. You know a pan-Indian alliance allied with the British was ultimately defeated in the war. That was the last opportunity for that kind of alliance. That changed the geopolitical relationship in North America. If you look at the treaty relationship after the War of 1812, you see increasingly that the United States is more and more dictating terms of treaties and less and less negotiating terms of treaties. The treaties are more and more boilerplate. They look like each other. And less and less individually negotiated because the geopolitical situation has changed. And during that period, the subject I teach, Indian law, gradually moves from a species of true international law, which is where it began to increasingly a subject of domestic policy, which is not really the same thing as, um, uh, uh, as negotiated international law. So because the War of 1812 eliminates the last possibility of a native alliance with another European power to threaten real security, 
the treaty relationship gradually changes. Now, I want to make that point by looking at its culmination. In 1868, three years before a statute passes that purports to, but does not, in fact, end Indian treaty making, two treaties are negotiated. The Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868 with the Lakota, Dakota, and Arapaho, ending uh, 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 Red Cloud's War, and the Fort Sumner Treaty of 1868 with the Navajo. The geopolitical relationship between the parties in these two treaties couldn't have been any different, any more different. The Lakota and allies had just fought Red Cloud's War successfully, and the United States was suing for peace. The Lakota had not been defeated, they had won. They had pushed the United States Calvary out of Lakota country. In fact, if conquest is the basis of all right, you should all be speaking Lakota today. But you're not. Notice they were in a strong negotiating position in theory. By contrast, Kit Carson had rounded up the Navajo, marched them 300 miles to the, uh, southern New Mexico, Bosque Redondo. The Navajo were petitioning to go back to their homelands. They had been militarily defeated. They weren't at war at that point with the United States. You would think these treaties would look very, very different, wouldn't you? If you're looking at geopolitical relationships. By contrast, if you look at them closely, they look very much the same. They're mostly boilerplate. They have very similar provisions. Now, if you look really closely enough with a microscope, you can see maybe that the United States agrees to pull its forts out of Lakota country to, in fact, uh, make sure that Westerners aren't settling in Lakota country, that the Lakota got some of what they wanted out of it. But for the most part, in the terms of the treaty, 90% of them are alike. So by 1868, for the most part, Indian bargaining leverage had disappeared. The treaties are pretty much boilerplate terms. This, by the way, is a very famous picture. It's, I think, one of the few pictures, in fact, the only picture I could find, although there's another couple by the same photographer, of a treaty negotiation that was photographed. This is the Fort Laramie negotiation with the United States commissioners sitting on chairs, the Lakota delegation, as they would want to do, sitting on the ground, facing the United States uh, negotiators. That's William Tecumseh Sherman, third from the left, uh, as part of the uh, negotiating uh, package. This is the first page, and I think it, uh, the last couple of pages are in the book, of the handwritten version of that treaty. So by the last third of the 19th century, in my view, two out of the three essential elements of treaty making had disappeared. Native agency and native consultation and the formulation of Indian policy had virtually been abandoned. Increasingly, the terms of the treaty were coming down from Washington, and the treaty commissioners were going out to Indian country to do what? To get the only one that marginally remained. Get them to sign on the dotted line. Get consent. So consent still was thought to be a requirement for a treaty and a constitutional requirement for the imposition of policy. But by the beginning of the 20th century, even the formal requirement of native nation consent had disappeared from the implementation of federal policy. How'd that happen? How did it come about that this idea of agency, consultation, and consent with which the relationship began, ended without any of them by the beginning of the 20th century. Well, again, it's the federal judiciary, the font of many bad things that come to Indian country. 
in the late 19th century, you recall America was involved in its first major colonial assertion of power over a whole lot of people who had not signed up for the American project. We were involved in gunboat diplomacy in the Caribbean and Latin America. When Colombia wouldn't agree to the Panama Canal, we just took it away from them and formed the country of Panama so we could build a canal. If that's not colonialism, I don't know what is. We overthrew the indigenous monarchy, a recognized republic, the Republic of Hawaii, with which we, Great Britain, and many other nations had treaty relationships. And then after the president declared that overthrow unauthorized and illegal, the people who did it handed Hawaii over to the United States and said, we'll take it. And of course, it becomes a state in the 1950s. So the late 19th century is the American colonial expansion period. Well, that's when treaty making really comes to an end. It's often thought it comes to an end with this statute now found in 25 USC, section 71, which basically says that no Indian nation or tribe within the United States shall be acknowledged or recognized as an independent nation, tribe, or power with whom the United States may contract by treaty, and then it goes on to provide, but nothing shall uh, abandon the prior treaties. Now, it's often thought that treaty making ended in 1871, but it didn't. This statute was the result of a fight between the House and Senate over who makes Indian policy. Why? Indian policy was then expensive. You had to pay annuities, you had to pay rations, you had to send doctors out, you had to send agriculturalists out. And who begins appropriations bills by custom? The House. But who ratifies treaties? The Senate. Is the House involved? No, not with treaties. So what did they do? Well, the House held up Interior's appropriations for a couple of years in order to get a say in this whole thing. And the result was this statute. But the statute wasn't intended to end negotiations with tribes, which is what many people think it did and was intended to do. Not at all. It wasn't intended to say tribes weren't sovereign. There's too much focus on the beginning part instead of the part about making treaties with them. All that happened after the statute was passed was that we sent treaty commissioners out to tribes, you can call them treaty commissioners, and they got agreements, agreements with tribes. And then what happened? We bring them back to Washington and we ratify them as statutes. What's the advantage of ratifying them by statutes? They go through the House as well as the Senate. So if you look closely at the way the Dawes General Allotment Act of 1887 was implemented, many of the Supreme Court cases talk about this in the reservation diminishment area, there's almost invariably an agreement that was negotiated with the tribe. What's that? It's really a treaty. From the tribe's standpoint, it's a treaty. But it was ratified by statute. If you think about what happened that took the Pahasapa, the Black Hills, from Lakota, many Penny Commission went out there. They tried to negotiate. They only got 10% of the Lakota to agree. But they brought it back and said, see, we got agreement, and they passed it as a statute. In fact, that may be the very first case, the taking of the Black Hills, where the United States did something without true consent, but purported consent, that nevertheless was passed by a statute. Now, it turns out, ultimately, these agreements, because they were passed by statute and went through both houses of Congress, soon started getting amended in Congress. So wait a minute, you got an agreement. Usually, if there's an agreement, you just approve it. But the House wanted changes. Do they go back and negotiate with the tribe? No, they just amend it as it goes through. Well, wait a minute. The whole idea of agency consultation and consent gets ameliorated in the form of the ratification. 
Now, any of you are familiar with the history of the fast track trade agreements? This will sound very, very familiar. It's the same problem in a modern context where they try to amend international agreements that uh, are being ratified by the uh, Congress. The final blow to even the consent idea comes in a case that a claims court judge once called the Dred Scott of Indian law. Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock decided in 1903, which holds what? Holds that Indian consent is not required to abrogate Indian treaty rights. Well, wait a minute, if we don't need consent, then do we have to negotiate anymore? We've already eliminated agency and consultation. Virtually overnight, true treaty making ends for at least 30 or 40 years after Lone Wolf. Now notice what I just said. It's not the 1871 statute that ended treaty making. It's the United States Supreme Court in a decision made in 1903. Here we have Lone Wolf, uh, Kiowa, Kiowa or Comanche, I can't remember which, Kiowa, I think, uh, leader who brought this case to try to thwart the implementation of allotment on his reservation unsuccessfully and wound up creating a precedent that was even more devastating than the allotment that he was trying to uh, thwart. So I think we can now begin to see why it's not surprising that in the 20th century, natives would look back at treaties as sources and fonts of rights. Even though the treaties were also the source of dispossession under the doctrine of discovery. Why would they do that? Because at least with treaty making, true treaty making, not what we had by 1870, there was tribal agency, there was tribal consultation, and there was true and informed tribal consent. All three of which were gone by the 20th century as what we now call the Beltway, as Washington, D.C., increasingly dictated Indian policy to Indian country instead of consulting Indian country about its relationships with Indian country. But the story is not entirely bleak. As Assistant Secretary Washburn adverted to, we're actually seeing a return of treaty making. Just like in 1871, agreements weren't treaties, we don't call the current things that we're doing treaties either, but that's exactly what they are. They're sovereign to sovereign agreements in which the tribes have what? Agency. They have, they're consulted, and they have consent. Now this began, and it's often overlooked, with a proposal that was part of the original Indian Reorganization Act that never got enacted by Congress. The Indian Reorganization Act was much broader in Collier's proposal than what Congress enacted. One of the reasons Collier proposed the recognition of tribal governments through the constitutional process is he was proposing to contract with them to have them manage the Indian service. What did I just say? Collier proposed 638 contracting in the original Indian Reorganization Act. Congress never passed the contracting part of Collier's proposal. It just passed the recognition of the government's part. But that was just a means to the end of the contracting. Ultimately, when Public Law 638 was passed in the 1970s, it spurs the beginning of a rejuvenation of sovereign-to-sovereign -sovereign agreements 
in which the tribes have agency. They can decide to take it or not. They decide what they want to do. They're consulted about the relationship. And the policy doesn't go into effect unless they agree, consent. Notice 638 contracting creates treaties. The hundreds of documents that Assistant Secretary Washburn was adverting to are all modern treaties. Treaty making is back. Other examples of modern treaty making. Tribal state gaming compacts. I know a lot of the tribes complain about it. I know it's an important burden on some of the tribes gaming desires. But what are they? They're negotiated agreements between an Indian tribe and a sovereign state. Yes, the federal government requires them. Yes, you can't game in class three without them. But they're treaties. They're treaties with the state. So now we have a new form of treaty, not just treaties with the nation, but treaties with states and local governments. And we have more of them. Think about what happens when these water cases that Assistant Secretary Washburn talked about are settled. The parties get together at a table. They decide to work out a relationship. They all make compromises. They're consulted. They're at the table. They have agency. And ultimately, they consent. Many of these settlements, water law settlements, eastern land claim settlements that recognize, say, Mashantuck and Pequot, these are all modern treaties. They're treaties made ancillary to what? To litigation. The litigation forced the treaty making. They're still treaties. The fishing rights settlements, particularly in, in Michigan, where it wasn't so much litigated after initial litigation as it was negotiated, all treaties with the state of Michigan, the tribes, and the federal government are involved in many of these. Increasingly, tribes and states are getting together on tax agreements. Again, what are these? They're treaties. Cross-deputization agreements with counties, sometimes with states. A form of treaty. So, we've witnessed an interesting curve in the policy of federal Indian law. Negotiation for the first 300 years. An effort at colonial imposition of policy on tribes for maybe 100 years, a little less. And now we're witnessing a return of Indian treaty making I've already made that point. Here we have Governor Andrew Cromo signing an agreement with the Oneida Nation, compromising many of the disputes between the two parties last year. I assume at the very head of that document, I've not seen it, it doesn't say treaty. It probably says agreement. It probably says memorandum of understanding. But what is it? It's a modern day treaty. And of course, why are we doing all of this? We're doing it for the seventh generation, for this little powwow toddler's future and the future of her children and her children's children and many others out to the seventh generation. So that the very same powers her community enjoyed when the British first contacted native Algonquian and Iroquoian communities in the Northeast, her descendants will enjoy in the future. And they will be involved in a sovereign to sovereign relationship that fully has what? Agency, consultation, and consent. I thank you for your time. Questions? No, I think we have to keep going. Thanks a lot. Great show. Thank you, uh, Professor Clinton, for that insightful and very informative uh, presentation.